Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. Double feature is rock and roll in a black hole. My name is Eric, and uh, joining me totally correct here this week was uh, <laughs> is Michael Kester. For the first time ever, totally correct. This this ought to redeem my Ghostbusters. We talked a little bit about Dahmer last episode, yep. right? And I had exhibited some skepticism. Totally about, rightfully uh, so. I it do just, not I'd fault you even a little. Never heard of what you were talking about before, and I thought it was fucking weird. <laughs> but of the, especially now, uh, as we've talked about with Kickstarter land, I live in California. Uh-huh. Everybody is insane out here. Yeah. Let me just make it very clear. I do not like being in California. If you like being in California, double feature show at gmail.com. Tell me what the fuck you do with your life. <laughs> but I'm surrounded by hippies all the time. And all anybody wants to do is climb mountains and fucking pet dogs and eat granola and go on bike rides. It drives me nuts. But there is so much pseudoscience out here. It is overwhelming. <laughs> and uh, you are, you're like the last bastion of my personal life that doesn't constantly bring me misinformation. Oh, well, thank you. Very welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> but you bring me this information about Dahmer. I go, what the fuck is this? I've never heard of it. This sounds like a pretty notable thing. How would I not know about this? And uh, I haven't done a lot of research. Yeah. Perhaps just seconds of research uh, since we last talked. But Wikipedia seems to agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you really had time or forethought to change Wikipedia before, uh, <laughs> before looking at it. So I don't know. Um, today we're going to take a look at totally normal issues of childbirth through American cinema. Okay. With uh, two films by directors we've uh, we've talked about on the show, favored directors oh, here man. at Double Feature Land. These are some of my favorite guys on normal social niceties. If I have to pick two directors to show me a family Christmas, who are they? Todd Salons and John Waters. Wow. And that's why we're going to do palindromes and female trouble. Man, and we are going to spoil them. We spoil these movies through and through. So if you uh, if you don't know every single fucking thing about the movie, we probably won't get to all of it. But you should avoid the show anyways. Thankfully, we've built in chapters, mm -hmm. and so you can use chapters if you're on uh, an iOS device or on your computer and iTunes on anything that supports chapters. You can skip over the movie you haven't seen. If you're not on one of those things, you could go to the website. And uh, I believe the website will tell you where the chapter marker is, uh -huh. depending on if I've cut that feature so that I don't have to know where the chapter is <laughs> uh, when I post the show. I, I believe that's still, yep. at the time of this recording, that is still a planned feature of the show. So skip over the fucking movie you haven't seen. There's one easy and simple place to start with palindromes. It's the most obvious and interesting aspect to the movie on, on paper. Aviva? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's Aviva. It's sure. Aviva being played by, what, nine different, or eight girls and a guy? Right, yeah. I love your, uh, your recent approach to the show, which is just call out the thing yeah. that we're supposed to be too highbrow to... Yeah, no, you're right. It's weird. There's a bunch of different girls. It's, listen, it's weird. Well, if, you, if we start dancing around that with, with this show, we're going to get very involved in a lot of stuff and i'm i'm always concerned now so glitter mouse has just released uh the first single from the album awesome by the um, way thank you you're welcome and uh and congratulations on your dual kickstarters yeah. you asshole i can't so far two you. for two <laughs> kickstarter is the greatest thing to happen to humanity <laughs> and the worst thing to happen yeah, to humanity absolutely true yes so we've been playing these shows recently and I've had to start doing this thing where we're writing our set list where we have this new song that everybody wants us to play. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is if we don't play it like within the first three songs, right. people are just going to get bored and leave. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. As an artist, you go, fuck the popular one. I'm not doing yeah. the popular one. Yeah. Fuck the obvious go-to one-line description of the movie. I'm not yeah. going to talk about that. So this is another awesome, we're always talking about don't know anything about movies before you go into them. That's the Agreed. chapter's yeah, spoilers absolutely. idea. Yeah. Know nothing about a movie and you will be the most surprised you can be. Absolutely. 
And I knew nothing about palindromes except that yeah, neither did I. Seen other Todd Salons movies and love other Todd Salons movies. Exactly. So I didn't know there were going to be different girls. Yeah, it can be took the me hell a long me. fucking time. Thank you. Good. Yeah. I'm glad we both got to have that experience. That's great. Yeah. Because I'm sure that's the first line of the description sure. for like the IMDB page, right? And that's the thing, is is the film is way more than that. Mm -hmm. But I think that that draws in the aspect and, and obviously they're beating you over the head with it by the end when she's coming sure, sure. Uh, as every different version of herself. Right. But this film is brilliant, Eric. Mm -hmm. I can think of, if you want to see a list of maybe a, maybe like a fifth of the films I've seen, go to double feature show.com <laughs> right. and just go a to Z. Yeah. That's maybe a fifth of the films I've seen. That list in my is life. so long. I don't remember some of those movies. Yeah. We're getting to that point where I can't tell you what happened. This may be the first film I've ever seen. It may be the first film in existence to deal with child molestation from the viewpoint of the child who wants to be molested. Right. Except maybe stuff we've seen a little bit with Todd Salons. I think yeah. that might be the only other time we uh, we can really think and, of that. And I'm using I'm using okay, so I'm I'm getting into I'm getting into tagline territory because Aviva doesn't want to be molested. Mm -hmm. She does want to have sex, right? And we've also spent a lot of awkward time on Double Feature discussing um, age of consent and pedophilia and what's okay with that. And when it's okay for a child to want to have sex and who they can then have sex with and, you know, sure. this, that, and the other thing. Sure. Go back to happiness uh, for yep. a really interesting conversation there. Well, and a lot of those themes in Welcome to the Dollhouse. Yeah. Which, uh, really quick, sequel, same world. His, his entire uh, filmography is set in the same universe. Same universe. Let's go with there that. There are three direct sequels in the Todd Zalans verse. Great. And it's Welcome to the Dollhouse, Happiness, and Life During Wartime. Those all deal with the same characters. Sure. Uh, with the exception of Dawn. So Dawn kills herself. Yep. Poor Dawn. <laughs> That's yeah. now we found out what happened to Dawn. She got obese and <laughs> killed herself. <laughs> I love that too. You think about, oh, welcome to the dollhouse. Poor little yeah. girl. Fucking offs herself. Sorry, I didn't mean to completely no. derail you there. So this film deals directly with Aviva, who um, is this girl. We see her young and she talks about how she wants to have a baby. And the majority of the rest of the film is her dealing with wanting to have a baby and not, you know, her parents and her family life not being what it ought to be. Right. Well, and also not want to be like Dawn. I mean, I guess exactly. that's an important thing right. to mention, too, is what better way to say, no, I make movies about very different things is to have your new protagonist come out and say, oh yeah, that uh, old protagonist, we killed her, yeah. and I'm nothing like her. So she continuously tries to have sex and conceive a child, and it starts off awkwardly because she's doing it with a family friend. Right. But it immediately escalates to that truck driver. Yeah, sure. And that is this weird moment for me when I'm watching it because I don't feel I feel more uncomfortable with it than I would if he were just straight up molesting a child. Sure. I don't want to come on here and be like, man, I wish he was just raping her or something. Makes it easier for you to go black and white, total yeah, villain. Exactly. Yeah. He's he's weird and you know, I don't know. The fact that he's a truck driver plays into it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. You got a soft spot for the road. Yeah. In <laughs> yeah. your heart. But she's not uncomfortable. She knows what she's doing. Mm -hmm. He ends up being an asshole. But right. for me, I have a hard time labeling him as much more than that. Sure. Which is why I credit the film strongly for him ending up being ostracized for being a child molester later. Because the film paints it like, well, wow, what a, what a cheesy, sneaky guy. He had anal sex with that poor girl. Right. And then left without so much as breakfast. <laughs> I fucking love, by the way, when she's she's Henrietta at that point, right? Yeah. And she's Henrietta's having a great fucking time. She's on cloud nine. The music's playing. She's having a great day. Meet you at the coffee shop. She's going down there, you know, yeah. fucking turns and closed. 
Yeah. It's not even a smash cut. It's literally, yeah. it's all in the camera reveal and the music, which I think is even better. Yeah. The smash cut is also notoriously funny and would have yeah. worked. Mm -hmm. But to go, we're going to follow her directly behind. The camera turns when she turns. Oh, whoops, closed. Yeah. And turn around and truck's gone. Yeah. Just a really great moment in the movie. And again, Todd Salon's perfect sense of humor yep. paints that as, <laughs> that guy was a jerk. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Um, which is why I think it's so great that later on when she reencounters him, he's got to live in the woods because he's a yes. fucking gross child molester. Right. And he's trying to get right with God. This is an odd thing about Todd Salon's movies is that on the surface, they're very unapproachable. Sure. They're very, this makes me feel weird. It tackles difficult subjects he's in a way that fun is of, not black and white. Yeah. And and his and yeah, you're right. And he's making fun of you know he's he's making light of this really pretty dark subject matter. I feel like so I don't know if you've ever shared a Todd Salons movie with somebody. <laughs> you. Um. I mean, other than me. Oh wait, no. You shared a Todd Salons movie <laughs> with me. You jerk. I remember that. So the thing about Todd Salons that I think is really bizarre, and I would really, I would recommend you trying it as an experiment. Uh huh. Take a movie. Palindromes is a really good one. Happiness, obviously, a great one for this. Take it and show it to a friend. Watch it with them and don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, see, that's about 50-50 for me on Todd Salon's movies anyways. But see if they get through the end and think it was a drama. Sure. Because Todd Salon's on fucking Netflix. Yeah. His, his movies say, you know, drama. Right. And so I'm imagining people go on Netflix and watch a drama and go, ooh, this, ooh, this is deep. This is dark and tackling. Meanwhile, I, I watch them as comedies. Well, and that's what I was getting at is that while they're on the surface, they're unapproachable. I think once you start to get into it a little bit, once the movies kind of won you over or you've become more comfortable with the environment, the heart of it is very much make things approachable and sure. tear down the taboos that force you not to consider, you know, right. What if this girl wants to sleep with these older men and become pregnant? Well, obviously there's a lot of societal things that say no and terrible and awful and run away. Once you strip those away, you can have a lot more interesting in depth conversation. Right. And also giggle a little bit. Yeah. Well, which and, is, and that's the thing I love is I think when you show somebody a Todd Salon's movie, maybe not the very first time, or maybe by the end, I think they're laughing a little bit. Yeah. Well, and I think palindromes is a great example because there are moments that through the wrong lens are just so heavy handed and <laughs> scary and dark. Like what? The, the, the two that come to mind for me are when she first goes to the, the Christian household. Oh my God. You know what I mean? I could do a whole show just on that. <laughs> Mama Sunshine. Yeah. And she goes there and part of me immediately goes, wait, are these slaves? Did she <laughs> right. kidnap all these kids? Right. Oh my yeah. God. Th that little girl can't even see. She doesn't even know that she's <laughs> stuck here. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Because all the kids have, you know, that's part of it is they're all outcasts and they're, you know, there's the little sure. blind albino girl and the land of have... misfit toys. Yeah, exactly. Right. Right. And well, and, it's like a deranged children's show, right? It makes it so hard to say what exactly is off about that before you get to the Jesusing and the kill abortion doctors, right? Well, and also don't forget the uh, the choreographed dancing. Well, that's what I mean is <laughs> the choreographed dancing. Like we can joke about it, but that should be okay. Sure, choreographed dancing and songs about Jesus. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with them. Correct. Factually, perhaps, but not intrinsically, you know, morally wrong. Uh, but man, you're watching it and maybe it's the atheism thing. Maybe it's, you know, we did Jesus camp on this show. Uh -huh. Maybe we just know what terrible things faith does for children. But God, as soon as they start singing, I just, for all the toenails that get peeled off on this show, yeah, nothing makes me cringe like jesus song yeah you know what i mean yeah how do you I, so i also get the feeling that you have really uneasy moments before we get deep into the jesus yeah how do you know that something's off there how is that effect being administered on the audience you know i think you know what nothing's it is? wrong they're outside playing some well, kids painting on a bus you know what it is for me is it's it's 
they're calling her Mama Sunshine and they're saying, Oh, yeah. once you meet Mama Sunshine, everything sure. will be okay. I mean, how it's many. It's got some Bioshock Infinite yeah, going on in there. How yeah. many fucking weird ass movies have you seen where, oh, you know, yeah, if, you, sure. if you meet O Long Johnson, everything will be right for you now? <laughs> uh, Don Piano. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's hard to watch once the song breaks out and the cringe factor and the one kid who's up front really pretty and just yeah. into it, ready to go and this thing really exists this is a real thing sure. in society this is a fucking illinois chapter awana youth camp <laughs> jesus bumping also apparently a thing that exists is uh an aborted fetus graveyard when was the last time an aborted fetus graveyard was the funniest thing you've ever seen in a movie you know, they weren't singing any songs there, so it was clearly more lighthearted. The dark <laughs> moments come uh, come with a beat, perhaps. Yeah. Oh, man. Also, uh, Richard really is in this movie. Yes, <laughs> he's so good. So this is a weird thing, because uh, Richard really has been in some fucked up movies, and we like seeing him. Oh, yeah. He's the only actor that I recognize from this movie. I forget that I'm not watching a documentary about something fucked up going on. And then Richard really walks down the stairs, and I go... Oh, thank fuck someone I recognize, an actor, to to pull me out of this a little bit and go, no, you're watching a film. It's okay. Yeah. Look at Richard Really, He's a funny guy. He's the doctor. He's dancing around and seeing him dance. Yeah. Just steals the fucking show. Love that guy. The other, I'm surprised you didn't recognize the uh, the fellow that uh, Aviva talks to about palindromes at the party. Well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Mind waiting five minutes? I gotta pick up some zip discs. Yeah. That's the funniest <laughs> fucking thing. I love Mark. I love that he fucking points out palindromes in the name. Yeah. Um, in everybody's names. And then also he has the moment at the end where he's just beaten in the points of, yeah, you think people are the same, you know, or you think they can change. They're actually the same front to back. Yeah. Like their names. Yeah. Like being the same at the beginning and the end. Yeah. But such an interesting point that people never change a philosophy that we decide to maybe help out newcomers to this film who go unapproachable, unapproachable, unapproachable. Sure. Oh, the child molesty guy at the party will explain sure. to me what's happening. Well, and, and the thing about that is, and, and that's one of the more, more interesting parts to the film for me, is that you take what Bob, Aviva, Otto. Yeah. All the characters with palindrome names, they never change. They start with a single two-dimensional goal mm -hmm. and then they get eventually to a place where hopefully that goal is more fulfilled sure they add a bunch of vowels and then yeah. they come back to the goal yeah exactly and i think that that's obviously the point they're making with the different characters playing aviva sure is that you can change the way aviva looks she could be a different gender a different right. race a different height a different age but aviva is out for the same basic levels of fulfillment right and mostly unshaken by anything else that's what i think is fascinating about aviva as a character is how often do you see a character in a film that gets you know statutory raped and inducted into a christian dance party and taken down to the abortion farm and then alongside an assassination of an abortion doctor and comes out at the end just really wanting to conceive a baby. Still, yep. Well, also, the uh, it has that effect, which is pretty great. It has the effect of a uh, fairy tale, go on adventures, right. vignetted atmosphere, which is wonderful. And then also, and maybe this is just my personal thing, but I feel like I treat the characters differently when it's a different actor. Yeah. And, you know, they're all portraying the same character, but seeing how um, the actors react to one person who is essentially the same human being, just portrayed in a different shape, in a different form, and thinking to myself that I would be treating them different because of the way they look. Sure. You just have a natural uh, way you approach social situations based on different things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of the reason that even though the movie's giving me a lot of clues that they're the same person... Every time I see a different individual, I kind of go, okay, well, what do I, especially think about this for the show. I get analytical. Yeah. I go, well, what do I know about this one? What do I know about this one? 
And it's not until the third or fourth one that I go, these are all kind of the same character. Oh, these are all the same (laughs) character. Aha. Thank you, movie. I'm now catching up to you. But I think it's great to play that mental exercise in a lot of different movies that'll use various actors to portray one person Mm -hmm. or the same actor to portray many people is to mess with the way you identify things visually or how you might treat someone in in a certain scenario. Especially in a movie like this where we're playing with the idea of you know, young kids and sexuality and pregnancy, Mm -hmm. the idea of pregnancy, but in a package where we have preconceptions. Sure. The child, you know, someone who's 13. Right. If you and I just start talking about pregnancy, we're going to talk about it a lot differently than if we realize we're talking about a minor or really someone who's barely a teenager. Mm -hmm. That throws the, the whole conversation off. Sure. Maybe not on this show where we can just fucking <laughs> talk about kids having sex and it's, you know, it's okay. Sure. Because we've, <laughs> we've talked about it so much at this point. But man, I remember in the, the beginning days and even the early Todd Salon stuff, anytime this would come up on the show, there was suddenly we were, we were treading on thin ice. Well, and we would constantly backpedal. Right. You have to be very careful with what you're saying. To, say, to make sure people didn't think we had sex with little kids. <laughs> Sure. Um, well, I suppose at some point we did. We were just little kids when we did it. Yeah. But that's the other thing I remember mentioning on a lot of these movies is you become sexually active at a much younger age than people feel it's okay to portray in film. Right. Or people feel it's okay to talk about. We've been uh, really discussing that a lot on the show lately, especially with the stuff last week. You know, younger people in sexuality, maybe never as young as 13, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, covering that uh, here it is again this week. There's really only one other thing I wanted to talk about in case we weren't pushing enough buttons here uh, before we get to John Waters, and uh, that's the abortion clinic. Abortion clinic. Yeah. I just, for as many awful things as happen in this uh, movie and terrifying things that, you know, should seem awful but don't, or things that are great but, you know, seem awful because of the packaging or whatever, uh, that fucking abortion clinic you know, in the second or or third kind of chapter where um, her mom is taking her and there's people protesting outside the clinic. This is something I kind of wanted to ask you about, but I'm not really sure what I even want to ask. It just (laughs) seems fucking awful. It seems like they are awful, terrible human beings. And especially as a libertarian, people who listen to the show disagree with me all the time and Mm -hmm. email and make jokes on our Facebook about Ayn Rand. So I'm used to having political disagreements with people, but yeah. you're going to this abortion clinic, you're seeing these people outside protesting, and suddenly this isn't a simple conversation I'm having with somebody about, well, is abortion right or wrong? What are the facts? What do we know about when life begins? How do we take religion out of it? Instead, it's just people who are terrible human beings. They're outside attacking someone who's going through an emotionally trying period of, yeah. of their life. We didn't talk about this a lot on, uh, you know, the the Fed, uh, Fred Phelps stuff on Red State. We could have probably gone into a lot, mm-hmm. but it strikes me the same way as I think people get worked up about that. About God, I can't believe these people out picketing funerals and so forth. I see this in palindromes, and even within the context of the movie palindromes, it's still one of the worst fucking things ever. Uh, I don't know. Do, are are these good people? Are they normal I, people? Are they know, just concerned about life? Something about them picketing just seems like no fucking tact. I know, miserable but human beings. You you have to keep in mind that that those people are of the mind that the person walking in there is about to commit murder. Sure. And would you or I find ourselves picketing the death penalty? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not trying to stand up for these people on a political level right. because I, I don't really, I can't. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> sure. I can't because I don't know. Yeah. But what I can say is if those people do truly believe that the people walking into the clinic are committing murder, if they believe that, and if you can put yourself in the mindset to believe that, take abortion out of it and just fucking have, say they're walking in there so they can stab a human being. Sure. Then I don't think they're a bad person for standing out there and telling them not to. I think part of it is their responsibility to try to get them to not commit murder. Right. However, 
whether or not they're committing murder is the step beyond that that I can't speak to. Sure. You know, with like a knowledgeable recourse. That was my interest in this conversation is figuring out as a humanist how I don't just look at those people with the gut instinct I have of don't abuse this person in an emotional state. Sure. And so that's that's kind of why I was curious to get your take on it as somebody who sees value in crazy things that people do who can yeah. find the best in that. If these aren't just, you know, if everybody standing outside an abortion clinic isn't just a miserable human being, yeah. but maybe has a uh, defensible position, at least in their own mind. So we're going to move in from uh, multiple actors playing one character to one actor playing multiple characters and furthermore, fucking themselves. <laughs> uh, we have to address that scene right away, I think. <laughs> Uh, it's it's crime and beauty and what I like to think of as a rise and fall life story of an individual uh, in female trouble. And that individual is played by Divine and fucked by Divine as well. Uh-huh. So we have uh, Don Davenport. Yeah. the We have this two Don. This is a Don double feature. Sure. This is Don after she's gotten fat, before she's <laughs> right. been killed. It's um, amazing how this that is, worked This out. is the prequel to Palindromes. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you thought it was Welcome to the Dollhouse, but there was, a, there was a missing 30 years in there. Yeah, in addition to all the great acting stuff, we'll talk about um, great comma acting stuff we'll talk about. <laughs> Divine also sings the Female Trouble theme song, which mm -hmm. is, I mean, let's step away from being huge John Waters fans for a moment and talk uh, with our Divine fan club hats on. Okay. Divine sings the Female Trouble theme song. If you're a big Divine fan, oh, I yeah. would imagine this is a pretty important moment in Divine's yeah. career. But yeah, talk about uh, this movie as an entire piece of Divine history. You get to see both the portrayal of a, a female character and a male character. But in that scene, I mean, it's a really long scene of divine fucking herself. It's too long and the noises are weird, Eric. <laughs> the dubbing? You don't like the fucking I dubbing? I was so, um, just to, to kind of give everybody a really hilarious place to discuss this scene from, mm -hmm. my roommate had his friends over and they were in our front room here watching the Silver Linings Playbook. I don't know what that is. It's an Oscar uh, award-winning film from last year. It had uh, Brad sports movie. No, uh, romance. It's got playbook in it. I know it had Bradley Cooper and um, Young Mystique. Okay, in it. Yeah. All right. Um, so they're watching this this romance drama Oscar film in the front room. I am in the kitchen in the adjacent room watching Female Trouble. Yeah. <laughs> With the volume as high as I can get it. Sure. So they're watching a really serious drama. And then suddenly from the kitchen, the sounds <laughs> of divine fucking herself. <laughs> yeah. So it's much so that they walked into the other room and asked if I could turn it down. Oh, wow. But first, first they checked if I was watching penguin porn or some <laughs> other such. At least they didn't see what was on the screen because I this know, might penguin be... porn would have been so much so much better for my <laughs> self-esteem. Oh my god. I actually thought that it would cross a line at some point and then eventually realized it started across the line. So yeah. it just got better and better for me. I love it the whole time. Uh -huh. I think the whole thing is just fucking beautiful. I never stop. I, this is true of all John Waters stuff, but I just never stop having a good time. Sure. This is uh it's a really I've become a divine fan as we watch and talk about these movies more and more. That was just an oddity in John Waters films for a while, but especially going back to the old stuff, I do realize that you know what, I I don't give Divine enough credit. That's something I go to these movies for. Mm -hmm. Especially I didn't realize how much more normal Divine is until I saw her playing a man and then yeah. went, no, I don't want this. Yeah. <laughs> this is the weirder of the two That's, options. Yeah, so it makes you back. so uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, her portrayal of a male is, it's <laughs> horrifying. <laughs> it is. Well, I also Which remember is weird. The, okay, so hold on. Let's just really quick go back to the sentence where I just said her portrayal <laughs> of a male. It is still, the pronouns are still a little strange. It's yeah. his portrayal of a male. <laughs> well, to me, divine naked under the clothes has boobs and a vagina you know yeah, yeah 
I I don't know. That's the just the, part the of stripper it. scene when she's stripping. Yeah, right. Part of me was like, woohoo, woman. Wait, yeah. nope, dude. Yeah, I felt like uh, Russ Meyer watching that scene. Yeah, I didn't know if that was just in my head or if maybe John Waters was channeling that a little bit. Yeah, and this whole movie is divine from start to finish. But yeah, I don't wanna I don't wanna walk that path without commenting on the glut of other dreamlanders that have sure. found their way into this film totally and made me there are moments that the other dreamlanders make me more uncomfortable than that sex scene <laughs> edith massey in this film god so i thought we had uh, seen uh, the worst of edith massey oh, on our show my god Eric. all right so <laughs> you had said before that you did not think and i don't know if this made it on the air or whatever but we've talked about this a lot that Edith Massey as the egg lady is yeah. in the scope of existing cinema one of the worst things for you. You just can't. Yes. When I say worst, I, I mean that in a good way. I mean yes. that John Waters has succeeded yes. in making... Yes. You just can't. You have trouble handling it. And you want to know something, Eric? <laughs> when Mink Stoll's character offers her an egg... Oh God! In this film, I know, I know. I thought of you. I was All like, I wanted was Michael. For I was just like, please take that egg and get in that basket. Yeah, <laughs> take the egg and get in the basket. Stop being a weird, sexy bird lady. Uh, oh my God! Oh, one of my favorite parts about Edith Massey in this movie is that so in being the rise and fall type of film, we cover many different eras of a person's life. Uh huh. Edith Massey wears the same clothes for like 20 years. Yes. You see her again, you know, decades later or whatever. Same fucking tight fitting. Yeah. She didn't grow into the outfit at all in that time, I guess. Oh, uh, and, and so, and I mentioned Mink Stoll who plays uh, yeah. Taffy. Um, Mink Stoll is probably one of my favorite Dreamlanders. She doesn't have a hook for a hand, so that puts her at a disadvantage, <laughs> but I think she's still bringing it. She's really upsetting in this film she is yeah i want to uh i'm going to put car crash as the moment for mink stole for me that i get more uncomfortable than divine fucking herself oh wow when, really when mink stole pretends to be in a car crash in her living room oh man starts i love pouring that. ketchup all over herself that's so strange you have that reaction because i have like a polar opposite i wanted i was as soon as divine said you should only play car crash outside i was like <laughs> Just play Car Crash outside. Wow. I think Mink I don't Stoll know is so much fun that I have this. I, I mean, I know exactly why it is. I think that's the desired outcome. Sure. But in my head, I just go, Mink Stoll must. I wish we were friends. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I Absolutely. just wish Mink yeah. Stoll was my neighbor and we could hang out all the time. And I just think she's a fucking blast. Yeah. I wouldn't suck your dick if I was suffocating and there was oxygen in your balls. It's yeah. one of the best lines of anything <laughs> ever so fucking true. written. I love that there's little to no age difference between her and the other actors. Yeah. <laughs> They're just um, all playing part. It's your friends outside playing pretend. Yeah. Or inside when Edith Massey comes and yells at you and tells you to take it out back. I'm a bad person because I don't know. I don't have his name chalked up to memory like I do the others. But the um, mustache guy. Oh, yeah, totally. Uh, because you know why I don't have his name chalked up to memory, Eric, is because when I think of him, the first thing I think of is a sausage tied to his penis. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, but every time I see him, part of me wishes I could be him. Really? Uh, just just his his persona is so much a staple of early John Waters for me. Yeah, right. Because he's the guy who in every film, every every John Waters film he's in, he's the guy who everybody else is fucking weird and he is so post weird. Yeah. You sure, know, Divine sure. is doing all this weird shit and Mink Stoll's playing car crash and whatever and everybody's got this insane sex-fueled thing going on and the audience is going, wow, these people are absolutely out of their mind. John Waters is a madman. Yeah. And then we have this character who goes, oh, yeah, I was into that like five years ago. This is just totally average for him. Yeah. Well, he's I just feel like I feel like he's been there and that's no good anymore. Yeah. Right. You know, he's that doesn't give him the rush. Sure. And, and that's why for me, I just whenever he shows up, I'm like, man, there are people that those people think are weird. Yep. And that's that guy. Well, there's always another level if John yeah. Waters has taught us anything. 
my favorite thing about female trouble in uh and it's one of the divine things and maybe this is why i think it's such a good piece of divine history is that uh this is a movie that begins um where this time divine is just one of the girls mm-hmm you know, and that's one of the things that makes this movie so special to me is they just as- expect us to believe, unlike the other movies where Divine starts as a thing that is inhuman and on a stage with a spotlight, this movie we just go into a college or into a high school or whatever, and it's just a bunch of teenage girls talking to Divine like she's a normal teenage girl. Like she's just fucking one of them. Yeah, yeah. And blending in, it's, you know, it's a kid's cartoon where one of the kids at the school is a robot or an alien or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's fucking Invader Zim all of a sudden. And you're just going, well, hold on. Does no one notice that that's actually a robot? It's those sitcoms in the 90s where one was a, you know, a bear. Harry and the Hendersons. Thank you. Yeah. It's Harry and the Hendersons. <laughs> yeah. That's what this movie is. And we do eventually get to the spot where we get, you know divine on a trampoline on a stage you know we get really the height of that her face is disfigured and she's dancing around posing playing up the diva that you know is the kind of reputation divine has off screen Mm -hmm. that when you think about this living persona just who this person was you would go see them being themselves in movies because they were such an oddity and such an interesting person. And Female Trouble does not try to play that down at all. Yeah. Where we would see other movies like Polyester, where, oh, Divine is coming across all these weird people, and, oh, she can't believe the terrible things she's seeing. This is more back in Pink Flamingo's territory, Mm -hmm. where we're going, let's introduce you to Divine. She'll do anything. Yeah. And this becomes really a story of, you know, that one time that Divine did anything and uh, and had to pay for it, of course, because there's a fucking trial. There's always a trial. Yeah. So so I was watching, like I said, I was watching this movie and uh, a friend of mine came in as I was finishing it. And despite his agape jaw for like (laughs) first 10 minutes he was watching. Right. Right. I. uh I kind of turned to him. I was like, it's, it's a John Waters movie. It's supposed to be like this. <laughs> right. and, uh, this is and, not an accident. And so just about the end of the trial, I paused the movie and I turned <laughs> to him and I was like, you've been here for 10 minutes. How does this end? And uh, cause this is before, this is right after the, the, the lawyer has gone find her insane. Right. Find it. And so I pause it. I go, how does this end? And uh, he says, um, Based on what I know about John Waters and based on the few minutes I've seen, they're going to put her in the electric chair and it's yeah. supposed to be really funny. <laughs> and I, I looked at him and I was like, I agree with you. And then we turned and finished the film. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, remained undisappointed. This thing about trials isn't even a joke anymore. I mean, yeah. I, I think we may have seen more John Waters movies that end in trials than don't end in trials. Oh, I I don't uh, think that's an show. exaggeration. I don't think that's even a remote exaggeration. <laughs> right. Um, Dirty Shame, I believe, does not end in a trial. Uh, but it it's, you know, it's deserving of the scene being the movie with possibly the most unrestrained uh divine oh yeah pink flamingos being of course the infamous one but not having its own stage and trampoline no one Mm -hmm. rubbed themselves with raw fish in uh right pink flamingos and then shot the crowd oh my god what a wonderful moment so then i once again return to my constant feeling of uh john waters makes me feel wonderful and i think it's it i'm starting to realize it's actually for different reasons in a lot of these movies Mm -hmm. but you know, we go back to this movie, and a part of it is just I love John Waters as a human being. I think he's great, and I think he's got a lot of interesting ideas. Yeah. And the way he looks at the world, like his relationship with criminals, for instance, mm-hmm. as, oh, a social oddity. I'm going to go learn about them, and what a fabulous person. Sure. I don't think John Waters would ever commit a crime, and yet he he pals around with criminals. Oh, yeah. Uh, like it's, you know, no big deal. Just all of that stuff. I think it's really, really fascinating. And then to see that person 
make films on a level that you or I could make in our backyard. This is far more towards the amateur film stuff on his spectrum, even though I think they all have that feeling to some degree. Mm -hmm. Watching him still learning to use the camera and still playing around with the weird zooming uh, kind of stuff that we saw in, I mean, in Pink Flamingos and even a little bit in Polyester. Mm -hmm. People pretending to use hairspray because <laughs> you don't want all the fucking hairspray going everywhere. You can't afford it in your budget or, you know, whatever the reason. Seeing them play pretend a little bit more and going back to the Mink Stole idea of playing pretend yeah. makes them seem so approachable as people. I can't help but thank God I wish it was 1974 and I could just go find them. Don't you wish you were a Dreamlander? Well, that's the thing, man. Is Every I, day? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think for a second that if it were that day and time in 1974 and I saw the five of them, that I wouldn't be able to just walk right up to them and go, hey, you need help making this movie? I'd love to help you with this. Yeah. And just fucking join the party. Yep. And uh, it's, it's tragic not being there, you know, not being able to be there in that place and time and live in Dreamlander's infamy. Um, but maybe for the better, as they might have just looked at me as a, a jump-roping uh, weirdo. I don't know. Yeah, John Waters would have looked at me as a weirdo, I'm yeah. sure. that's. I it's probably don't, I don't think I hit the bar for them, <laughs> is, <laughs> is where the rejection would actually come from. Love the Dreamlanders. Love John Waters. Love all of it. Uh, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, where you can email us using a contact form or the email address doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. And you can also go there to find out what's on the show next week. But now that our Kickstarter has been funded and uh, we know there's going to be a next week, let's just tell people what it's going to be. All right. Uh, next week, we're going to do The Skin I Live In, which is a Spanish thriller starring an Antonio Banderas. And then we're going to do Miranda July's The Future, which is kind of a, it's a, it's a, diagonal sequel to me and you and everyone we know yeah finally miranda july back on the show yeah and uh again and in, in not pretending we're bigger than it i'm excited for a female director on the show uh, next yeah. time me too uh I'll watch more fucking film and bye